Okay, welcome to our third part of the lecture on long-term memory and learning. And this part will be mainly about episodic memory and just a little bit about prospective memory as well. So we are in our scheme by Squire. We are here, we are still in declarative memory. We talked about semantic memory and now we are turning to episodic memory. So episodic memory is memory for events. And it's not about factual knowledge of something we know has happened, but our own personal experience of such events. And this episodic memory has certain features and characteristics. And one of them is that it can be actually situated in time and space. So we do a kind of mental time travel and we know, okay, yeah, then this happened and it was there. This is a typical feature. A subclass of these episodic memories is autobiographical memory. And these are the personal experiences that are really important in our life. And examples are the first date, the first kiss, the birth of a child, marriage, so the wedding, having had an accident or things like that. While episodic memory is about everything, also including the boring things and what you had for breakfast yesterday morning and things like that. Endel Tulving is the memory researcher in that area and he coined the term episodic memory in the 1970s. And he made a distinction between knowing something, which is referring to the factual and semantic, the uh, memory, and remembering something, which he described a feeling that is located in the past, and this is episodic memory. So knowledge versus remembering your own life. The episodic memory has the following characteristics. And as I already mentioned, there's this subjective sense of time, the mental time travel, like, okay, this was roughly two years ago, that we can do that quite, quite well. It has a connection to the self. So we really have the impression that that's our life, our memory, a part of ourself, which for regular facts like London is in England usually is not the case. It often has the primary form of visual images so that we know, oh yeah, it was this scene, it looked like that, but can be a very holistic experience. So we also have the time, place, the emotions we felt, the context, we can say, okay, I remember that particular thing and that happened because person A said something to person B. We also may remember the smell and the taste of things. And so when we try to recall such a memory, then most of the time it's recalled as a holistic memory and everything in one go. It's rare that we say, okay, we just uh, remember the taste of that event without also remembering who was there, having a visual image and things like that. And it's also subject to massive and rapid forgetting. And this may come as a surprise, but if you think about that episodic memory is really about everything happening in your life, then this includes, for instance, every breakfast which you had in your life. And you might be quite good to remember what you had for meals today so far, and maybe yesterday, maybe two days ago, it may get a little bit tricky. But what did you have last week? What did you have the first Monday of the month last month for breakfast? Unless you have exactly the same thing every day, you probably can't remember. So a lot of our everyday experiences are forgotten. And only those who are more important are stored in episodic memory. And those which are really important of these episodic memories are the autobiographical memory. You can remember that the autobiographical memory is that stuff which you would put in your own autobi autobiography. 
Okay. Um, I already mentioned that in the last part. Episodic memory is absolutely critical in eyewitness testimony. And one of the key researchers in this eyewitness testimony is Elizabeth Loftus. She did a lot of so important studies. And the point is, or the the critical thing is that eyewitness testimony is acceptable evidence in trials. And sometimes people are sentenced to really severe sentences just based on eyewitness testimony. So we really need to know whether such memories are stable. And what we are talking about here in eyewitness testimony are episodic memories. Eyewitness is what this person has experienced from their self, from their own view. It's not factual knowledge which we try to get out of that person. So are these memories stable? And maybe we can even modify them. And this does not always need to be uh, on purpose, it can just be by accident or by being inept when questioning people. Okay, so let's have a look at a couple of studies which has been done by Loftus, Loftus and her group. And in this example, participants viewed a short video clip of a car accident. And afterwards, participants were asked what they saw. And they were asked to provide an estimate in miles per hour how fast they think the cars have been. And this is really an objective thing. People, All people have seen the same video clip where a car with an objective speed moved along and crashed into another car. What they manipulated across different groups of participants was the word they used to describe the collision. So they could ask how fast were they when they smashed into each other, <clears throat> how fast were they when they hit each other, and also how fast were they when they contacted each other and things like that. And what they found out, sorry I forgot to remove that, we don't do this poll, what they found out is that how fast were they when they smashed into each other revealed the highest speed rating and when you ask for hit then you get lower speed ratings if you say something like how fast were they when they contacted each other you get the lowest speed rating and the estimates differed from the highest to the lowest by I think around 10 miles per hour which is a lot and which can make the difference between saying you were speeding or well, you were well within the speed limits when you were driving within a town or something. Another example was again where a movie of a car accident is shown and it's noteworthy this movie it doesn't show any broken headlight but then if you ask have you seen the broken headlight one group or you ask, have you seen a broken headlight for the other group? You see, when you use the, you get many more people saying, yes, I've seen a broken headlight. So just by using the wrong word, you induced that people report having seen something, although they haven't. That's quite important and has quite a bit of impact. So these studies show that the way how we phrase and word the questions, it can affect the answer. And if this answer depends on recall from our long-term memory. It's unclear whether this is truly false memory. And it might be that people are not quite sure about hmm, what was the speed of the car they may rely on implicit information which is given in the question. I can't really remember exactly, but when they smashed into each other, they must have been rather fast. And if I can't really properly remember and they contacted each other, that sounds like a little bump, you know, they must have been slow. So, and people don't do that necessarily consciously, it's just, you know, if you're unsure, and can't properly remember, you may rely on that. 
Loftus and her group then asked, can we maybe uh, modify, in a quotation marks, memory even more subtly? And they did a very nice study on that, which I would like to present here. It was in the late 1970s, and here they showed a series of slides only, which depicted an accident. And there, this car here <clears throat> hit a pedestrian. What they now did was that half of the participants saw a stop sign here at the crossroad, and the other saw a yield sign, give way, you know, like this. And what they then did is they um, asked participants questions and they manipulated information very implicitly which wasn't that necessary to answer the question. An example is did another car pass the red Datsun? This is the car which was waiting and was causing the accident while it was stopped at the and they manipulated that either stop sign or yield sign. And the sign they used here, the word they used, could either be consistent with what they have seen, so in the slide they have seen a stop sign and you were saying stopped at the stop sign, or inconsistent with what they have seen. So they have seen a stop sign, but you ask why well, it was stopped at the yield sign. Then participants spent 20 minutes on a completely irrelevant task to kind of um, get a certain time distance in there and to also make sure that this information really is out of short-term memory so it must have if if this had an impact it must have come from long-term memory and in the end they did a forced choice recognition test where they have shown the two pictures we have just seen one with a stop sign and one with a yield sign and they said what have you seen before and now what um, happens is, if people have seen the stop sign, but you ask them in this question, uh, you included yield, then some of those participants actually chose the picture with the yield sign, and the other way around. This is not like a tremendously massive effect that you use this just once and everybody uses it differently. But they remembered something which had never occurred. Because this study is a little bit more complex, just go through that very quickly again. So, for example, participants saw the stop sign. Then you present them a questionnaire which has this stopped at the yield sign. And to answer the question, this information is really irrelevant. It could be ignored by the participant. You could just say, did another car pass the red dots while it was stopped at the junction or just stopped? then 20 minutes some task, and then you do the recognition test. Stop sign versus yield sign. And they just ask, okay, point to the picture you have seen before, left one or right one. And then some people say, oh, I choose that, although they have seen the stop sign. So just a completely irrelevant semantic information changes when you have to recognize a picture you have seen. That's quite a bit of profound impact what it can do to our memory and shows how fragile it is and how careful we have to be when we, for instance, interrogate witnesses. And this research therefore has shown that the recall can be influenced and memory can be altered. And there are even more extreme examples where uh, people try to implement completely new false memories into people's minds with um, using the family as well of the participant, you know, trying to convince that they had an episode in their life as a child that they were lost in a shopping mall. And if you do it in a smart way, then some people will start to believe, oh yeah, that must have happened. But the question is, these are all laboratory studies. What happens outside the laboratory, in the real life? Because eyewitness testimony or 
episodic memory may really be affected by factors just like arousal, physiological arousal. You know, if you're sitting in the laboratory and watching slides, you're probably very calm and relaxed. But if you are a proper, if you are witnessing in real life a shooting where somebody dies, that's a completely different situation. This has been investigated and in a study where uh, there were a couple of witnesses in a shop robbery where the robber was killed in the end. And the question is, how good it was the memory of these witnesses who have been in this high arousal, stressful situation several months later? And again, we skip the poll everywhere. And it has been shown that the memory was still pretty accurate. And what they did was that they compared the reports of the witnesses to the original police reports, which they have given a couple of uh, hours or a few days after the incident. And then they tested them again month later. So it seems to be that it's more the normal memories, the not so intense, stressful memories, which are fragile and maybe distorted. But these highly emotionally loaded memories seem to be less sensitive to manipulation. It's not completely ruled out. And you may have a person who is not very emotionally affected or aroused by such a scene. So it doesn't mean that what we just learned um, is not important for eyewitness testimony. It absolutely is. OK, if you have any questions on episodic memory, because we come to an end of episodic memory, then please um, post it in the forum. And we will now continue, because it's just very brief, with prospective memory. So let's just focus on this declarative memory. We have semantic memory and we have episodic memory. We just spoke about this. And when we now place that on a timeline, and we are right here, then this memory is in the past. It's about events which have happened to us. It's about facts we have learned in the past. So this is called retrospective memory, memories about the past. Prospective memory is memories about the future. But this sounds a little bit silly. So a different way to phrase it, prospective memory is our ability that we can remember to remember something. Let's have a look. Not too detailed, but just to cover it. So, its prospective memory is our ability to set up our mind to remember something in the future. And examples are, I will call you tomorrow, for instance, or next time I'm at uni, I will return the book to the library. Some people would put it into the category of declarative memory, because it's also a conscious process, conscious memory. And there are two different types of prospective memory. One is event-based. And in this category, in this type, the future action is triggered by an event. So, for instance, if I am at the library, I will return the book. And no matter when I'm at the library, it can be tomorrow, can be next week or next month. If I've really set up my mind to it, then this memory will spring to my mind and say, oh, I'm in the library, I wanted to return the book. So it's the context. Or another example, next time at Pizza Express, I'll eat a pizza margarita. Or it can be time-based. Something like, um, I will call you at 4 p.m. So it's the actual time we live in. Or I must remember to watch the TV show tomorrow at 8 p.m. So when we're approaching at 8, suddenly pops up, I wanted to watch the show. Of course, you are probably fully aware from your own experience that this is by no means perfect. But it's surprisingly good that we can put a memory in our mind which lingers and then if the condition is met, either by an event, surroundings, being somewhere, or by time, that it suddenly is recalled and we are made aware of it. That's prospective memory. And again, if you have questions,
post it on the discussion forum on BBL. Okay, thank you for listening to that part. <laughs>